Yeah, so maybe just before um, sharing my presentation, I'll tell you how I have come to be working on this particular thing, which is uh, for maybe about uh, 15 years, most of my work was on Tibetan Dunhuang documents. Uh, and then I, uh, and I was, how can I say, I didn't like reading uh, canonical texts because I was suspicious about what had happened to them, you know, between when they were translated and when they were uh, published. And for linguistic purposes, I wanted to rely on genuinely old uh, materials. Um, but then I uh, was looking into the, the morphology of certain verbs, and I found that they just, there weren't enough of them in the Dunhuang materials. In particular, I was looking at the verb for to shave. Uh, and then I found that in the Vinaya, in, in, on a single folio, there were uh, all of the paradigm of the verb to shave. So then I thought, oh, I have been too hard on the canonical texts. You know, they are really uh, essential for linguistic study. But in order to, um, you know, uh, get back to the old Tibetan period, then of course you need to do textual criticism. And uh, doing just uh, work on this, this short passage, sort of three folios or something, it has, you know, I haven't finished and it's been years, although I don't work on it every day. Um, and I've only collated 14 conjures. So I realized that if I was going to, uh, you know, collate all the conjures, uh, it was too difficult a task. So I'm discussing the application of uh, natural language processing to Buddhist textual criticism. And just to start off, I think it's useful to contrast the state of textual criticism between Europe and Asia. So uh, it's one of great inequality. And I just think a salient point is that the Nestle Allen critical edition of the Greek New Testament has appeared in 27 different versions since its initial publication in 1898, whereas the canonical literature of, of Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, and so on have never been fully critically edited. And, I, and that's both because we have larger um, canonical traditions in Asia, but also because we have fewer philologists. So new radically more efficient methods are needed if these vast Asian literary traditions are to receive the editorial attention that they deserve. So my presentation will touch on three research contexts, traditional editorial methodology, textual criticism in digital humanities, and uh, the study of the Tibetan conjure. So a, a, a word of definition, uh, what do we mean by a critical edition? Well, an editor faced with disagreements in the wording of different copies uh, that purport to contain the same word, which we call witnesses, either can faithfully copy one manuscript, which is a diplomatic edition, or can pick readings from multiple manuscripts to create a new version uh, that is believed to best reflect a lost original, and this we call an eclectic edition. Um, in either case, the editor should you know, record the different variants in an apparatus. And the critical edition is an eclectic edition that has such an apparatus. And uh, sometimes you see in uh, people, you know, call things critical editions, which are diplomatic editions or which are, you know, commented editions. I think this is bad practice. I think we should really say critical edition only for eclectic editions with an apparatus. So now looking at uh, traditional editorial methodology, certain outright mistakes are both obvious and unlikely to happen independently. And this is the key insight to Lachman's editorial method. So manuscripts that share uh, these indicative errors can be placed as sisters in a family tree, which we call a stemma. And once the structure of the manuscript tradition is clear, the most ancient readings present themselves as, as those that are inherited on independent branches of the family. So just to, to emphasize this point, because editors will more likely agree on what is obviously a bad reading than what must be the author's original reading, this system which uses the bad readings in order to lead to the good readings is quite objective. The font of a textual tradition is reconstructed in three steps. Uh, we can describe and collate the witnesses, infer the stemma based on uh, the distribution of indicative errors, and then at each place of disagreement, choose the best reading given the stemma structure and external factors. The ability to, to recover the origin point of a textual tradition rests on two preconditions. First, the tradition must have a meaningful origin point. And second, we, we have to have sufficient evidence available 
uh, that, that is pertinent to that origin point. So just to give two examples that are kind of extreme cases, uh, the 394 extant manuscripts of uh, De Civitate Deo ref re reflect a single work written by St. Augustine. And in this case, uh, Lachman's method organizes this evidence really well. Whereas uh, the works attributed to Homer lack a meaningful origin point because they have a fluid uh, and oral uh, origin. Uh, but nonetheless, parts of originally fluid traditions may go through a redactional zero point that is amenable to recovery. Uh, so whereas it's meaningless to reconstruct Homer's Iliad, uh, reconstructing the Iliad of his editor Aristarchus is methodologically possible if uh, the evidence permits. So Buddhist sacred literature overall, like the Homeric or rabbinical corpora, uh, emerge from a pool of tradition that is unamenable to reconstruction. And nonetheless, the systematic translation of Buddhist texts at the Tibetan imperial court is a reconstructable zero point. So, you know, which is to say, it should be possible to do a critical edition of the conjure in a sense, yeah? So let's make a critical edition of the Tibetan conjure. So, uh, you know, as I was saying, that's impractical given uh, current methodologies. So we see what uh, tools the digital humanities furnishes us. Uh, and most research in computational textual criticism focuses on drawing up stemata uh, from a pre-prepared collection of potentially significant variants. A computer infers a stemma using one of three approaches, and I'll go through these quickly: uh, distance-based, parsimony, or maximal likelihood. So, distance-based methods measure a texted text disagreement disregarding processes of change. So it, basically they just say how many letters are different in these two versions. Uh, it's, it's a, 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 the main advantage is it's computationally uh, easy. It's quick for the computer. Uh, it's a pretty naive approach that you know, doesn't have much to recommend it. Then parsimony methods are what uh, most people use. Uh, in, in this technique, uh, we look for a, a family tree that presumes the fewest number of changes. It's, the idea is it's sort of Occam's uh, razor, right? The, the, the simpler explanation is probably the right explanation. But as a heuristic, uh, it assumes that all changes are equally likely. And that's just manifestly not the case, right? So this uh, approach falls prey to uh, what's called long branch attraction where coincidental innovations are mistaken as diagnostic. In, in, in the terms I was talking about uh, traditionally, um, then uh, uh, the, it identifies uh, shared innovations, but not shared diagnostic innovations. So the third type is maximal likelihood methods. In this case, um, uh, a different likelihood is assigned to different types of changes relying either on a priori assumptions or on training data. And possible stemata are then tried out to find which one ma best matches the, the actual uh, data as it exists. And this is a realistic approach, but it has a very high computational cost. Uh, and in addition, uh, change models built on faulty assumptions can yield worse results than parsimony and models uh, derived from training data, which, you know, won't be built on faulty assumptions because they're based on you know, judgments that philologists have made, uh, are, uh, on the other hand, very expensive to create. So overall, it, it's a sort of, it's the approach that, you know, all things being equal, one would want to take, that should one should take, but it, it's uh, too expensive in terms of computer time, in terms of philologist time. Uh, so it's not uh, currently really used very much. Now, are these phylogenetic uh, methods even worth the trouble? I think is a good question to ask. Uh, oftentimes there's little benefit over traditional approaches. And I'm just gonna give one example and I don't mean to pick on him for it, but um, Apple in uh, 2019 collated 12 witnesses of the uh, Arya Avalokiteshvara Paripracha Sapta Dharmaka. And he used the parsimony based approach to draw up their stemma. But his edition merely transcribes one of the 12, 12 versions, which is says a diplomatic edition is not a critical edition. And he doesn't even report the indicative errors that the stemma relies on. 
So the application of computational techniques has not in fact added any value. Because the primary branches of the conjure stemma are already securely identified, there is no need for phylogenetic reconstruction. So computers are being used most where they are needed least. And I think that's you know, uh, something we should change. Yeah? So my proposal is instead that we use natural language processing for the steps of collation and reconstruction, not for drawing up a stemma, at least not for the conjure. So um, we should model an editor's behavior uh, in comparing different manuscripts of the same work as a series of natural language processing steps, uh, each one adding a more abstract level of linguistic analysis from noting spelling variation up to understanding syntax. So there have been some efforts to uh, computationally model uh, manuscript collation uh, beginning already in the 1960s. And these have coalesced into two software products, which are called Yuxta and Colatex. The teams behind both tools subscribe to what they call the Gothenburg model. And that's because they had a meeting in Gothenburg to decide on this model. Uh, and here is the Gothenburg model. Collation can be thought of as five consecutive steps. Segmentation, regularization, which is the purposeful ignoring of certain differences, alignment, analysis, and visualization. So collation software automates the final three steps, but presupposes segmented and regularized machine-readable transcriptions of the witnesses beforehand. So you, you have to have, have, you know, have transcribed and regularized uh, diplom you basically have to have done a diplomatic edition of every single witness and then feed that into the computer. So computers are not yet widely used in transcription segmentation and regularization. And just to give some examples, otherwise computationally well-informed humanists working on Latin, Greek, and Tibetan still transcribe manuscripts, segment the text into words, and regularize the orthography entirely by hand. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the, let's say the model we should turn to is, uh, I like to call it industrializing philology. So um, it, it, we should get the computers to do the actual hard work as much as possible. And I turn for my theoretical framework here to Karl Marx. Uh, and he says the path of industrialization is analysis through the division of labor which gradually transforms the operations of the worker into a more and more mechanical one. So the Gothenburg approach to dissect the problem of collation into smaller, more manageable subproblems follows this course, but we must take their program further. So uh, in order to do that, let's look at what a human editor uh, does. When a traditional scholar prepares a collation, she reads each witness, noting its spelling, grammar, and style. Because scribes acted differently in different times and places, and with different genres, editors consider all of these features. Uh, segmentation, i.e. describing what to compare when you're collating, uh, requires an appropriate theory of scribal practice and regularization, which is deciding what to ignore while you're comparing, requires an appropriate theory of sc scribal caprice. And just to give one example, which is medieval French poetry, uh, scribes who were copying medieval uh, French poetry freely changed the tense, mood, and person of verbs. The same scribes actually copying Latin poetry would never do that. Yeah, so that's is it just important to, to keep the concrete circumstances in which the scribal practice was happening in mind? So, um, so for medieval French, the regularization step of our workflow uh, should ignore inflection and account only for distinct words. That's lemmatization in NLP terms. In, in, in a sense, then, collation of you know, medieval French manuscripts needs a, a different, needs to target a different moment in the NLP pipeline than it would for, for example, uh, Latin. Um, so, so Moss describes the ideal editor in the following way. He says, the most reliable collator best understands the text, but is able to switch off this knowledge in order to work with mechanical rigor. So a computer innately applies this rigor, but permits alignment at only one level of analysis 
different levels lead to irreconcilable collations. Maybe I'll just uh, like uh, dwell on this for a moment. Um, if, if I'm editing something by hand, you know, I can decide in this case, I'll look at, I'll compare whole phrases. In this case, I'll compare words. In this case, maybe even I'll just compare letters depending on, you know, my knowledge of, 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 uh, of, of, of the state of the field. Whereas it, using collation software, you just feed in segments and then the computer compares them. So you can only decide I'm looking at, uh, you know, uh, one level of analysis. I'm either looking at, uh, uh, I'm either ignoring inflection or I'm not ignoring inflection. I can't sort of turn it on and off. And in some ways that's good because it means we have to be more explicit about what we're doing and rigorous, but it means we also have to teach the computers in a sense to be as flexible as the philologists are. So existing computer approaches do not permit nesting units of comparison, even though they are frequent in traditional practice. So uh, as the effectiveness of a machine relies on the power of knowledge objectified to again, quote Marx, uh, for each witness, we must objectify all levels of linguistic analysis into explicit annotation and then apply the alignment algorithm to this united whole. So this is my proposed workflow. We divide the Gothenburg five steps of collation into eight steps, five for inspection and two for collation. Now, I, this is not, I don't wanna present this dogmatically. Uh, you know, if, we, if a project actually got up and running, maybe we would need 11 steps or 15 steps or whatever, yeah. Uh, but here are they. Inspection, uh, which consists of uh, transcription, segmentation, orthographic regularization, part of speech uh, identification, and syntactic analysis, and collation, which is the actual alignment analysis and visualization. So basically, the, the, the last three steps are, you know, in principle automated, uh, but the first uh, five are not yet. Now, I just want to flag the risk uh, of compounding error rates. So more full automation faces the obstacle that uh, errors compound at every step. And, and just you know, to, 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 as, as a kind of a thought conceit, if you like, um, and if each step was 97% accurate, then this eight step pipeline would yield an overall accuracy of 78%. So it's just to say that you know, the, the accuracy will go down over time. Uh, but actually, these don't don't put too much stock in these calculations because that calculation assumes that the the errors at each level are independent, whereas of course they're not. They're going to rely directly on each other. So the the concrete results might be a lot worse or might be a lot better depending on exactly what kind of error is made. Um, but in any case, you can bring down uh, the error rates by increasing the manual training data. Uh, at each step, uh, but uh, the, the manual preparation of data required for training statistical models is always the most onerous aspect of NLP. It's extremely expensive to compare uh, to compile manual training data, and it's very boring to, to do it if you're the person who you know, has to do the training. Um, but we can uh, get over this bottleneck using a, a, a relatively, um, well, at least uh, in this area, uh, a new technique, which is called active learning. And I'll describe that here in a moment. The computer guides the editor to annotate just those examples that most improve the performance of the models. In this way, the number of cases requiring human intervention is kept as low as possible. And you can think of it, uh, you know, basically as um, um, a trade-off between with manual training data, you might have a lot of students or even like monks uh, in, in somewhere do the more basic tax, tasks manually. Uh, that's expensive because it involves a lot of human labor, or you can uh, have the computer itself tell you which examples would most improve its own performance. Uh, and then have uh, like an expert philologist um, just uh, annotate those examples and, and then retrain the whole uh, system, which actually is very expensive in terms of computer time. Um, so there's a trade-off between, you know, um, philologist time and computer time in that way. Uh, to date, uh, there's only been one uh, paper, as far as I can tell, that has applied active learning uh, in digital humanities and only for one NLP task. So there's a lot more that could be done in this area. So now turning to the conjure, 
The comparative conjure, the conjure Pei Durma, sponsored by the China Tibetology Research Center in Beijing, uh, includes an apparatus. Uh, and it was uh, begun in 1986 and published between 2006 and 2009. Uh, it, let's say the text itself reproduces the 1733 derogate version, uh, but it records variants from seven other woodblock uh, conjures produced between uh, 1410 and 1934. And, and I want to actually just hold this up as, you know, really the pinnacle of uh, conjure editing so far. You know, some people are hard on this project, uh, but those people haven't produced a, <laughs> a complete edition of the conjure. So, uh, so I, 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 I think that, uh, you know, this was a, a, a wonderful project that has had uh, great results. Uh, but uh, the eight uh, collated witnesses reflect only one quarter of the available evidence, excluding all manuscripts from Bhutan, from Nepal and Ladakh, uh, and those held in foreign libraries. In addition, by sticking to the 1733 text, which is to say by, do it, by doing a diplomatic rather than eclectic edition, the editors made no use of the variants that they so carefully assembled. And now I think that was prudent in, in many ways, but uh, it does mean that we don't yet have a critical edition of the Tibetan uh, conjure. So the limits of this 20 year project, I think that's what I want to emphasize was, was that you know, this was a great project. It was very expensive, took a lot of work, but only got us so far. And um, and I think that, that those limits uh, foreground the need for a radical change in methods. So just to give you one sample, I referred at the very beginning uh, that I to the fact that I had uh, edited a short passage uh, from the from the the, the Vinaya. So I did. I compared fourteen conjures, which is uh, sort of less than half of the available conjures, uh, and I came up with this uh, Stambaum. And here I've circled the ones that are included in the Pedorma. Uh, and so you'll notice just from that structure that half of the tradition, you know, uh, is not reflected in the in the Pedorma uh, collection. Uh, simply because they've omitted the Dolpo conjure. So it just shows you that, you know, you, yeah, e even if you've edited a lot of conjures, it doesn't mean that that one you haven't edited um, uh, doesn't actually hold, uh, you know, some really important uh, information. So I would, you know, like to propose uh, that, uh, that there be a complete critical edition of the conjure. By complementing traditional scholarship with cutting edge technology, this project, I think it becomes feasible, particularly in China, where the state of uh, NLP is so advanced uh, and, and uh, including for Tibetan. So let's uh, just sort of reiterate, if you like, the methodology. Uh, first, we use natural language processing tools to model a critic's understanding of a text. Then we use active learning both to maximize the impact of a critic's labor and to minimize the errors that can attend a long NLP pipeline. So these are the two overall approaches in terms of uh, how it would be done in a linear fashion. First, you, uh, you transcribe the manuscripts. So, so transform the images like uh, you know, JPEGs into bare e-text into something like uh, you know, a Unicode TXT file. Then uh, inspection, we transform the bare e-text into increasingly linguistically annotated e-text. Then we compare these enriched e-texts to each other. Then we restore the archetype in as far as possible. And uh, well, and then and then we've done it. Yeah, as long as you record all the variants. Uh, and uh, just a look at uh, the Tibetan NLP tools that would be necessary for doing this. Uh, they by and large exist, which is not to say that uh, some of them wouldn't have to be improved, but they by and large exist. So for instance, there is a uh, handwritten text recognition. And, and in this case, I'm just putting citations for um, you know, papers that discuss the tools involved. So handwritten text recognition, segmentation, orthographic regularization, part of speech tagging uh, and parsing. So there are, you know, there are solutions to each of these steps. Uh, and that's, uh, that's all of my presentation, uh, basically. So I, you know, I'm, let's say, I, to some extent, it's a sales pitch. You know, I, I think that um, um, those people who are interested in, uh, in canonical Buddhist texts, particularly those that exist on a large scale, like the conjure, 
um, might want to think about, uh, you know, some some um, some NLP approach to editing uh, the conjure. So thank you very much uh, for your time and attention. So in a sense, the answer is no. And here's the, the reason why is, is um, let's say, I can point you to su specific successful NLP tasks. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, the, the, the BDRC, you know, the Buddhist Digital Resource Center, they are working on uh, OCR a lot now. So uh, um, especially for kind of nicely printed Tibetan texts, but also increasingly also for xylographs. Um, and they have, I think, uh, together with this organization called Asukia, they have uh, done, um, they've made digital copies of three conjures. I think they're the, they're the Litong, the, mm, I don't remember, I would have to check. But in any case, so for, for example, we do have now, you know, e-texts of three different conjures. And, and those have used some quite fancy, uh, especially for the xylographs, some quite fancy uh, digital techniques. Uh, but of course, you know, while, what I'm proposing is we have to do that for the other, you know, 25 conjures, right? Uh, and then, you know, uh, like James Apple is, I think, the person who has done this kind of work most in terms of using actual collation software. But as I was saying, you know, he, the poor fellow, he does all the transcription himself he does all of the orthographic regularization himself he prepares everything you know painstakingly for the computer then runs it through the collation software and then is told that the stem the stombaum uh, sorry the stemma and it turns out it's the stemma we already knew yeah so <laughs> um um and and maybe what i would say is i think that this kind of work he's been doing is extremely important uh, partly just in order to, you know, because let's say now he knows how to do it, right? Which is to say like, this is quite technical work and just getting those skills is important. Uh, but I think that um, the vision of actually combining NLP tools to, to do textual criticism has not yet really happened. There are some, I've, I've found some, especially young scholars who are doing their PhDs on Latin who have gotten pretty far. And I can send you some citations if you want for that, but I don't, I, ha I haven't seen any work uh, that's been done in this area uh, um, in Buddhist studies. Although I would say that um, there's the tokarianists in Vienna, of course, you know, they're, they're, they generally only have one fragment for each text, right? It's not, it, they're, they're not needing to collate things, but they use some quite fancy tools. So they're also a good uh, people to look at, I think. So the problem that currently exists is that you have to convert, you know, your document into a string of symbols, and then you have the computer compare that string of symbols. So one way to do it, let's say the way we do it in English, actually, is exactly what you're saying, which is they, they just, they actually just put a space, like, let's say you have singing, you would just say sing space ing. And then <laughs> you would compare the roots and the inflection separately. So that works for English. Yeah. But it doesn't work for Tibetan, for instance, because Tibetan has oblat, or I mean, so does English a little bit, but Tibetan has a crazy verb system. So what you have to do in a language like Tibetan is you have to um, go through one, one step where you do it in that kind of linear way. And then you come back again and you say something like um, Zung, you have to refer to Zin, you know, like you, you, you have to have some other step and that step is called lemmatization. No, you can make that, you can do that with software. Yeah, and we have software that's, that does that actually for Tibetan. Mm -hmm. um, but let me just compare, let's say Tibetan and Chinese. Mm -hmm. So for Tibetan, the easy part is recognizing the letters because there's only 30 of them um, so that means that you're that early on in your in your in your natural language processing pipeline you have very good results yeah uh, it's, or it's very easy to get good results mm -hmm. but then later on when you're doing something like uh, like referring som to basams then it's harder and so that step might be 
worse. Whereas if you were doing it with Chinese, then the step of actually just seeing what characters on the page uh, is going to be, uh, you know, perfectly possible, yeah, but require more training data or require more active learning or some, somehow will be harder than it is for Tibetan, yeah. But then later, when you come to the lemmatization step, it's basically you get it for free. You get 100% performance for free because there's not any complicated morphology. So I would say basically any, any one language will have its own uh, sort of weak points and strong points. Uh, and, but those will appear at a certain moment in the in the workflow. Yeah. But but in principle, it can all be dealt with with enough time or money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and 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 the point I'm trying to make is, you know, even if it costs, I don't know, ten million dollars or something like that, it's going to be a lot cheaper than doing it uh, the old fashioned way. I, I want to appeal to, let's say, your, everyone's Buddhist nationalism in a way with this, with this point about the Greek Bible, which is to say, how can it be that the Greek Bible has been critically edited 28 times, yeah? <laughs> but that the, 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 the conjure, <laughs> the Buddha Vachana has never once been critically edited. Uh, I mean that's a history of scholarship thing. So let's say let me just say where I'm where I'm uh, taking this from is 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 Paul Moss, who you know, which is what we use to learn textual criticism back at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a very nice recent book by an Italian guy who's actually a Dante specialist that I relied on a lot. Yeah, yeah. His name is Provato. Uh, but yeah, this I mean let's say I think that that uh, this stuff happened in Alexandria, but there's actually. There's also a tradition of it that Leonard has written about, you know, in 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 Buddhist circles, and I I actually have that in the written form of the paper. But like to say, people have been collating, you know, Taisitu Chuki Jungne did this. Um, so I, I should just make clear that this presentation is uh is actually a sort of a manifesto, right? Like it's 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 something I think everyone. <laughs> Yeah, it's like something I think we should all do. It's not something that I'm doing because I don't have uh, money for it at the moment. I actually asked the British government, I asked the British government for some money to do it and they said no. So, um, so, so maybe I'll ask again uh, in a year or something like that. Um, but, uh, but, but what I would say is uh, on GitHub, there's a, a place where uh, Tibetan NLP workers have are all sort of collaborating a little bit uh, uh, so and on github and on zenodo and you know um these things are quite easy to find but also i'm very if someone wants to email me i can send you some links okay so the 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 question in a sense is if everything works well what would happen and here's what i would say is i would say that uh we take like you have a little machine and you put into it uh, um, uh, photographs of the manuscript pages of all conjures, you know, and I think there's about 40 now, yeah. And then out the other end comes a something that looks a lot like the conjure page. Dorma. I would put the notes at the bottom of the page, um, but there would be an addition with the variorum at the bottom. And now, if that's done entirely automatically, which I think it could be, um, what problems will arise? Well, all kinds of problems will arise. Maybe there was one spot in one manuscript that was particularly blurry and the computer has mistranscribed it. You know, that's that will happen. Or maybe in some cases it has chosen a reading that is consistent with the structure of the Stammbaum, sorry, uh, of the stemma but uh, that happens to not be the, you know, in some absolute sense, the right reading. Maybe, you know, there needs to be, for instance, the computer cannot do, um, what's it called, um, conjectural emendation. So, you know, in many cases, it would need a good conjectural emendation to actually solve a difficult philological problem, which is to say, you know, like, am I trying to make everyone unemployed by replacing them with machine? Well, in a sense, yes. But in, a sense, but, but in a in a sense, no. Think of it just as you know, if if you could go to the bookshelf and there was a beautiful critical edition of the Conjure, you would still have to exercise your intelligence in using it.
and you would still have to go back to the original manuscript for some purposes. But now I think you see people, I mean, let me just give you an example, like Shane Clark, like let's say Buddhologists, people who, who work in Sanskrit, Chinese, and Tibetan, they just kind of choose like the Tokpalas conjure because it's easy to read and because it's relatively good philologically. I think that's a, a very practical choice, but you know, think uh, how much better it would be if rather than just using the Tokpalas conjure, because you, you can't, you know, it, 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 you, you would stop being a Buddhologist if you read every single passage in all 40 conjures, right? Um, uh, instead, you could just turn to this automatically made uh, critical edition. I think that would be good. Thank you so much. Thanks to Professor Nathan Hill for his